Hello, my name is ScienceBeard, and this is a video on what the laws of science can teach us about our everyday lives and what they support and do not support. So the question I'm asking, and I tend to answer to some extent, is what can we learn from the first law of thermodynamics? Let me get, just get a couple of assumptions out of the way. There is an objective reality which is partially accessible to human beings, with the caveats that human beings cannot perceive all of it, and human beings cannot perceive that objective reality unfiltered or unaided. And this perception can only be made increasingly objective, but not completely. Everybody is the expert on their own mental states, with the caveat that human beings are capable of self-deception, lying and misinformation, and that language makes communicating those mental states less precise and sometimes ambiguous. Clarification is needed and ultimately cannot guarantee completely accurate communication. In addition, reality cannot be perceived objectively. Other people exist and are capable of holding beliefs as sincerely as everybody else. Beliefs are held based on different functions. They can be rational or emotional or a mixture of the two. Beliefs may not be changed or changeable by confronting them with either rational or emotional arguments. Principles which are sincerely held strong beliefs may inform other beliefs based on rational or emotional grounds. I will use the word scientist to mean anybody trained in scientific models and thinking. It is not intended as a value judgment on thought processes or the validity of arguments. In fact, knowing nothing about science, you can still derive very many of the same conclusions which scientists come to. Verification may be a different problem, however. The first law of thermodynamics can be stated in many different ways. For example, the total energy content of an isolated system is constant. Energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Or in the context of machines, you cannot obtain more energy out of a process than has gone into it. By energy, scientists mean a highly abstract idea. This is why energy is not easily recognized or accounted for in everyday life. Some of our everyday experience tells us that energy may be flexible and unpredictable. The word energy in everyday life means something symbolic and vague or flexible more often than not. There are some instances when the concept of energy informs us correctly, but the word is usually used quite wrongly. In everyday language, energy is often said to be consumed or used up or to have run out. What is often meant are energy sources. The fuel has been burnt, the electricity has been consumed and so forth. In addition, energy can be restored, recharged, replenished. This stems in part from a confusion over eating, sleeping and muscles and more generally the body recovering and in part from a misunderstanding of the replenishment of chemical potential in energy sources such as recharging batteries or filling up the tank in a car with petrol. The expression I am recharging my batteries has also been subsumed into the everyday as a way of saying resting, which could not be more at odds with what charging a battery is about, which is actually a challenging process for the materials a battery is made from. This neatly reflects the psychological or metaphysical, almost supernatural quality of the word energy. And real life experience tells us that letting batteries rest or letting fuel vapor settle in a car running on empty can mean the difference between having to get up right now and replace the batteries in a remote control or having to push the car that much further to a petrol station or electricity socket. Energy is one of the big ideas in science. Its value lies, like so many other ideas or concepts, in its predictive power. There is a finite dimension to it in science. It is one of those quantities that are, scientifically speaking, intuitively absolute. Energy is not relative to anything. There is no such thing as negative or anti-energy as far as we know. There is no willing the rocket to go that little bit further, while a human body may be persuaded by a burst of adrenaline. The latter, of course, being a full willing on in that sense. If the energy wasn't there in the first place, that finite quality would win out. In order to do something, either a rocket has enough fuel, an electric car or an organism has enough stored chemical energy or not. There is no debating this. Sometimes, of course, it looks as if this is not so. The car's fuel gauge shows empty and yet you have made it to the next petrol station. This is a consequence of our existence as a fairly macroscopic entity. 
The precision of instruments we use are either not sufficiently accurate to determine the actual energy content of the remaining fuel, or deliberately constructed in such a way that they will underestimate how much is left, for psychological reasons more than anything else. The scale at which we exist is not suited to experiencing discrete or parceled off quantities of many things that are vital to a proper understanding of science energy, light, multi-atomic, atomic and subatomic particles, or individual charges on ions or, generally speaking, the finest divisions of matter, energy and time. The statement that the total energy in an isolated system remains constant is not entirely based on empirical observations, but also on the idea that things cannot spontaneously pop into existence without a consequence for the rest of the system or universe. A way to express this could be to say that there is a cause and effect for all phenomena, so you can create matter or even antimatter and energy as long as the amount of energy and mass remains constant. This is not a perfect way to view this. Photons can be created spontaneously from the relaxation of electrons. Unstable nuclei can decay but the potential has to have been there. What can we learn from the first law of thermodynamics then, which would apply to the scale of our existence? Well, there are a few things. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Even if it is free to you, somebody else will have had to put effort into making it. As a consequence, if you trace the energy requirement all the way back to its source, there is an ultimate source. And before somebody says it, this of course tells you nothing else about that ultimate source, just that there is one. Most people will understand this expression as an acknowledgement of a cost to everything, energy or something else. If something looks too good to be true, it usually is. This is another take on the same theme, but this time the implication is that you certainly cannot get out more than the effort you put in. This applies to whole systems rather than local phenomena, but this is something for the next video on the second law. So the first law tells us that the most we can expect to come out of an effort is the same we put in. If it appears that we get more out than we've put in, then we haven't accounted for all of the effort in the same way that if we get more energy out of a plant, physical or chemical or biological process, then we haven't accounted for the energy properly. It is possible, of course, for individuals to receive more than they put in, but other people have to put that extra in. And this is where the boundary between science and philosophy becomes a little blurred, but in a good way. A good grounding in the first law tells us when things are not as they seem, even when they appear to be. For example, if you watch a magician at work and they levitate somebody else, you may not be able to work out how they did it, but you can be sure that they did it somehow and grounded in physics. A new way of looking at the situation may be needed, and you may never work it out, but clearly the so-called magician has. This is an important realization for proof of God derived from miracles. For a scientific example, think about Herschel's discovery of infrared radiation. Herschel wanted to know which type of light carried the most energy, if any, and he split white light into its components and exposed identical thermometers to it. He also employed a control just outside of the visible components of light. The thermometer, apparently exposed to no type of visible light, heated up more than any of the others. There must have been another type of light which was unseen by the human eye. Discovering something about a hitherto well-investigated phenomenon opened the door to another thought. What other types of light might there be? Energy has always attracted thoughts of magic, the creation of something from nothing. Increasingly, magic is seen as a device for storytelling rather than an alternative to explaining the world. I would posit that this is in no small way due to a basic understanding of the first law of thermodynamics. However, a common misunderstanding or broad acceptance of the first law in wider society is unfortunately still a long way away. Scientists who accept the first law as a means to bring order to the rules of the physical world, which otherwise would be random and disorganized, are often accused of a closed mind when it comes to the supernatural. Scientists, maybe more than others, are aware of the dangers of cognitive biases and are nevertheless still as susceptible as everybody else to falling into those traps, a pet theory perhaps for which adverse evidence is overlooked or cherry-picked. The first law of thermodynamics is a foundation which also requires a uniformity of the universe, or at least locality of the observer and origin of the phenomenon under observation. In other words, it requires the universe to obey the same laws wherever the observer is situated and the observed phenomenon comes. If, for example, at the core of stars, there was a hole through which the stars attracted hydrogen from another universe, then the predicted fate of the stars and the universe would look very different. 
Therefore, the first law depends on the isotropy of the universe. If this was found to be incorrect, then the law would not survive as a law. A deep appreciation of the first law, though, can often be the starting point for problem solving. It is equally important to realize that this is not absolute. At some point, it may be superseded by another law. Having said that, the first law has been verified over and over again. And as far as science is concerned, it is settled and applies universally, i.e. everywhere we have looked for observations. Hence the need to introduce an unknown, such as dark matter, when observations do not conform to expected outcomes, rather than a rejection of the first law of thermodynamics. No scientist would value an imagined phenomenon over an established law. What we think we know defines what we are looking for and don't know yet. Phenomena or observations which are not compatible with the first law of thermodynamics will lead to a better understanding of reality because it forces your hand to try to either disprove the applicability of the first law in this situation or to find something which, like infrared light, has not been detected yet. The first attempts will lead in the direction of the latter rather than the former. Until such time, the first law remains a tool of sober contemplation. If an observation is made which appears to break or violate the first law of thermodynamics, then Occam's razor can be used to cut away all supernatural explanations and the search for the real source of the observation can begin. Where else would you start? If you had to consider all fantasies or imagined causes, the only thing left is to throw up your arms in despair and concede that you couldn't show that the observation wasn't supernatural. Why do I pay for electricity when I could just drop a ghost in my refrigerator? Why do inventors of free energy machines ever switch off their machines? Just leave them running. Why is breatharianism rejected by scientists out of hand? A closed mind? No, just the confidence that there is no such thing as no lunch, if you want to survive. The first law of thermodynamics is also a call to action. Some theists have their own pragmatism. God helps those who help themselves. This is essentially a restatement of the no free lunch. Unfortunately, this does not speak to motivation. Actions which are regarded as either good or bad at the time are possible, but we can see that the first law of thermodynamics does not mandate either the existence or non-existence of a god, merely the inaction of such a supernatural entity. So what is the difference between having a god who has no discernible effect on the universe and no god? For me, the first law of thermodynamics is a good indication that reality works just fine without a presumptive god and everything is as it should be. But I can understand why the wish for a god, even one that has an effect on the universe, is appealing, but is ultimately incompatible with the first law.